Welcome. Thank you so very much. Uh, welcome to the panel on the legal construction of gender and racialized class relations. This is such a uh, amazing conference. And my name is Dee Charles. Happy to be functioning as the um, timekeeper, otherwise known as the dictator. Um, so my goal is to simply introduce our panelists um, to um, get us going and then invite you all in the conversation. So they will be speaking in the order that they are sitting from my left to my right. Samir Char is a clinical director and associate dean for equity initiatives and director of the Workers' Law and Organizing Clinic at UC Irvine. Martha McCluskey is the Professor Emerita at the University of Buffalo Law School and board member of the Class Grit and Appeal, um, which is the Association of Promotion of Global Economy and Law. Um, Al Said is a professor at UC Berkeley Law School. He writes on intellectual property, courts, and gaining trust. Um, and then you'll find is a professor here at Harvard Law School and coordinates the Law and Local Economy Program at HLS. And we'll start with Samir. Thank you, Kitty. Um, thanks for having me as part of this conference. Um, on the program, it's a real honor. I, I just want to recognize um, Sanjay, Corinne, um, I wanted to add a few others while we were <laughs> And we met James Van earlier, who edits the blog, and he's so wonderful to work with. So these are the producers of everything that we're doing here. And I just wanted to make sure to appreciate that. Um, in an essay that I published last month, Pedagogy or Prefiguration, I argued that lawyers and law students have capacity to engage in prefigurative thinking with social movement formations. To do so, I argue that it's essential that we develop three things um, in the way in which we work together. One was a shared social analysis with our movement partners. Two, a capacity to engage in place of radical imagination, even as lawyers. And three, an aptitude for truly dialogical relationships with movement clients, neither overly deferential nor uh, marked by lawyer domination. In this talk, I will focus on the first uh, capacity of lawyers to, to engage in shared social analysis with movement formations. I will do so in the context of a project on which we have been working in the law school clinic that I direct, the UCI Worker Law and Organizing Clinic. I'll take a bit of time to define what I mean when I talk about prefigurative thinking first. Um, and I think I hope that you consider this a contribution to what uh, Nate Holdren recently said on Twitter is critical lawyer theory as opposed to critical legal theory, um, or the further development of an LPE praxis. I'm also picking up on Angela Harris's comments at the earlier panel on the need for a focus both on teaching as well as on lawyering and how some of what we're doing in, at this conference gets translated into practice. So I'm going to talk about the project first. In June 2020, at one, at one of the heights of the pandemic, a group of workers gathered outside of the packing plant in which they worked in the Central Valley of California. They started a picket with signs as their supervisors watched from inside of the chain link fence at the edges of the work site. Some workers who had tested positive for COVID joined the line from the inside of their cars. Led by a 42-year-old mother of two, a packing plant veteran, the workers called on their employer to adopt protective measures in the wake of the rash of COVID infections that ravaged the workforce. In May, coworkers had started to fall sick, bringing the illness to the children and elders in their home, in their homes. According to the workers, the company had originally not provided or required the use of PPE in the plant. Later, it charged workers $8 per mask. By July, 150 workers had been infected in a workforce of approximately 400, and one worker had died. The conditions of the plant were part of a larger story of essential workers in the low wage sector subjected to sickness and premature death. COVID tore through communities of Latinx immigrant workers in the Central Valley, much as it did in meatpacking plants in Tennessee and Minnesota. These were the essential workers as defined by the company under federal and state guidelines, ensuring that the company could continue to earn revenue from sales of food during the pandemic. I would say not coincidentally for importation not for use even within the United States. The workers were unable to, in the words of Aziz Ahmed and 
Jason Jackson, control their risk of exposure to COVID. During and after the first walkout, and with help from the United Farm Workers or the UFW, the worker leaders spoke to reporters and generated a spate of stories on the conditions in the plant during the first wave of the pandemic. They led a second walkout the following week after a poor response from the company. The company then began an extended campaign of discipline and terminations aimed at the worker leaders. One worker was prevented from using the computer that they used uh, in their work to tally products on the plant floor and was eventually discharged. Um, another was fired immediately. Others who were hired through temporary staffing agencies, this is the Kelly Girl problem that both of the following papers are going to talk about, were told that their contracts had been terminated. UFW was not planning to organize the plant for a variety of reasons, but it sought to honor the solidarity demonstrated by the workers. The clinic came to represent the fire worker leaders through the union's primary outside counsel, Martinez Aguila Socho Law Incorporated. Working with the UFW lawyers, the WLO clinical team started researching potential claims uh, as we uh, interviewed workers and began doing informal discovery as we moved towards drafting a state court complaint. In doing this work, we asked uh, a bunch of questions, and there's a lot of questions littered in my talk here, because I ask more questions than I have answers, and I have to say, honestly. How might we advance a critical understanding of the conditions to which essential workers were subject during the pandemic? How do we accentuate and elevate the worker solidarity and led to determinations? How might we depart from standard representation and litigation to think, think figuratively with our clients and collaborators? And toward what future might this collaborative work get there? So a word on prefigurative thinking, which has been important in developing my thinking with regard to uh, the kind of collaboration that we can wage uh, with movement partners. In the last decade, uh, in the teeth of the breakdown of the neoliberal political order, the rise of fascist and white supremacist movements and accelerating climate change, progressive movement formations in the United States have generated radical critiques of social, political, and legal structures. Movements have intervened across fields of con contention, including policing and criminal incarceration, migrant detention and deportation, global warming, and resource extraction. Uh, there are many examples. They include the movement for Black Lives, the, the, the policy platform, the Free Our Future Manifesto, authored by Mi Gente, uh, the Green New Deal advocated by uh, the Sunrise Movement, the Red Deal by the Red Nation. These movement platforms start by opposing policing uh, and criminalization, surveillance and mil militarization, fossil fuel extraction, and dependency. But they then pivot to defining new horizons for public safety, migration, and protection of land and water. Movement activists collectively acquire critical understandings of interlocking structures of power in their areas of focus, as well as across areas of focus, and they think toward drastically redistributing power and reconstructing institutions. The moment, this moment, as we, as, as Jonathan Simon talked about yesterday, we're in the midst of a cultural recovery is filled with peril for all but those with extreme wealth. Labor remains relatively weak and left movements persist in the face of strong countercurrents. It's a moment that requires radical experimentation with new utopian institutional and social forms. Those utopian forms are relatively small in scale or necessarily narrow in application due to the power of capital and the disciplining force of the state but they suggest new institutional arrangements and help us imagine more just and equal social relations on a wider scale. Prefigurative projects fight the despair of ostensibly unchangeable institutional and social conditions and provide a means by which we may engage in collective utopian thinking unfettered by the ongoing and depredating operations of capital facilitated by law. Building on Marxist and anarchist threads in the literature and focused on experimentation on the left, Amy Cohen and Bronwyn Morgan, I can tell you this firsthand, I think she's here uh, somewhere at the conference, argue for the co constitutive nature of prefigurative practice and legality. They identify four characteristics. One, innate pluralism um, and indeterminacy of law provides a sense of possibility and encourages the use of legal techniques, meanings, and practices. Two, in unpredictable and alchemical ways, people acting collectively draw on legal logics and thought ways to constitute themselves. Three, people persist in using legal power, notwithstanding their deep dissatisfaction and sometimes deep loss of faith in the capacity of traditional state-based modes of law reform. And four, people do not allow uncertainty about outcomes to inhibit experimentation with legal change. 
Prefigurative thinking provides a framework for projects that social movement organizations may use to defy the inevitable retrenchment that follows from significant challenges to the status quo. And it sharpens uh, the, our capacity to see nascent prefigurative practice in the world around it as it is. Unfortunately, legal education may be especially hostile to progressive prefigurative thinking. Um, in Duncan Kennedy's words, famously, it reproduces hierarchy and conformity. Law, both its omnipresence as a force of social control and a near total absence as a constraint on capital, is a central arena of movement contestation. Law is exceptionally fraught terrain for radical political imagination due to its use as an instrument of social control, as well as its use to discipline and domesticate disruptive social movements. Legalism and left movement spaces has been the subject of sustained critique, including of its tendency to permeate movement strategy which social theorist Dylan Riley has recently called a juridification of the imagination. Further, the prevailing legal ethical rules prescribe particular roles for lawyers and clients and bar third parties from that relationship. The rules structure relationships in which clients have limited say as to the conduct of their cases and are prohibited from explicitly bringing organizers into their decision-making. So in worker representation with the decline of unions as intermediaries, um, there's a, lawyers are less likely to have the capacity or means to engage in long-term dialectical relationships with their clients. Organizers, the intermediaries who would intimate, initiate, foster, and facilitate such relationships are blocked from having a formalized role in the relationship. And class action practice does not usually foster the kind of thinking I'm talking about in dialectical relationships between lawyers and clients. The law and the rules of professional conduct structure and immunize the collectivization and coordination by the owners of capital and formally delegates authority to entity managers. By contrast, non-unionized workers are generally isolated and alienated, including in their relationships with lawyers. It's as if the corporate lawyers can only have relationships with individual shareholders, but not the entity intermediaries who may speak for the corporation as a whole. It is organizers who often help workers envision possible futures above and beyond the ones in which they are mired. In a context in which our clients alone work or starve, or in many cases, in the words of Noah's Acts, work or go to jail, the voices and visions of organizers enable prefigurative thinking in our collaborations. Okay, so how do we overcome these constraints placed on our management capacity? Through both through legal education as well as professional discipline. And I suggest at least one thing to do is to think about shared uh, social analysis. I suggest that a shared social analysis or sociological imagination amongst collaborators is essential. We must examine the root causes of the racialized extraction of migrant labor and capitalism and ask how do we understand global historical structures of inequality and the ways in which they manifest in our current moment. A shared knowledge base and analysis could elevate our utopian prefigurative aspirations and abate the instrumentalization and domestication of legal practice. By understanding background distributions and structures of power, we can alter the work that we do with movements and challenge conventional approaches to public interest representation. Um, oscillating between ideas and practice, between history and the present, fuels professional growth and disrupts complacency and acquiescence to an established economic and social order. I heard Frank Pascal talk about professionalism yesterday, so I'm high on professionalism at the moment when I usually wage uh, against uh, professional forms. Our study in the clinic uh, of the Black radical tradition and its animating critique of racial capitalism, as set forth by W.B. Du Bois, Neville Alexander, Cedric Robinson, Luke Wilson Gilmore, Robin D.G. Kelly, amongst others, can prompt new understanding and cause us to, re to think structurally against the individuation of hegemonic neoliberal discourse. Um, in the paper, I talk about the conditions facing low wage work, um, in part uh, born of austerity um, measures, uh, as well as uh, illegality and uh, the use of the carceral system to marginalize workers, particularly low wage workers of color. Um, as well as the domination that takes place as a consequence of those dynamics in each individual workplace. Um, uh, uh, legal scholars and commentators should just begin to see how profit seeking converged with white supremacy uh, following 9-11 uh, uh, to radically expand immigration, post-secondary detention, 
And in labor law, as we're well aware, state efforts to monitor and intervene in employer employee relationships have been subverted by the fissuring of the workplace, the outsourcing, franchising, and misclassification, and by the long war on collective bar organizing and bargaining with disproportionate impact on workers at the bottom of a pyramid of commerce and industry. These conditions are creating an underclass of low wage workers across borders, migrants, and indigenous peoples born or forced into the bottom segments of social hierarchies in varied national contexts. Legal and social movement responses that assume the sedimentation is a consequence of dysfunctional markets will not alter the underlying conditions. I'll just, I, I'm, I'm out of time, but I wanted to say a couple of things, almost out of time. Um, I want to say, I, I, I've gone on, I'd like to describe the problem, but I just want to say that the way in which we define the problem that we're working on in the clinic on this case determines what the trajectories are for our collaborations with movement collaborators. If we define what we're doing in the clinic as working on wage theft, then we uh, do nothing to attack the underlying, the larger structural conditions that our clients face. We just do a, a hamster wheel of cases over and over again, noting the same conditions facing our clients. If we define it as racialized labor extraction, then that evocative frame allows us to start thinking with our movement partners uh, about ways in which we might take on those structural conditions. I'm not saying we have the answers, but I'm saying that we need, as I said at the end, we need to ask the right questions with our movement partners. And too often, leading practitioners um, are uh, uh, kind of engaged in those uh, individualized uh, small board cases um, or the uh, stylized class actions that don't result in uh, taking on of the structural conditions. Um, I can speak also about how you shape the complaint uh, to bring uh, the idea of racial capitalism into it um, in Q and A, um, but these are some of the things that I'm thinking about, and that, that I think these theoretical friends help push us towards. Thanks. Thank you all uh, for being here and for um, you know all the exciting work that's being done in law and political economy. So let's yeah okay. So law students are widely taught to frame legal issues as questions of whether to maximize resources overall or whether to distribute resources to a particular group or contested normative end. And on the one side, it's portrayed as the economic goal, on the other side, it's the social goal. Um, law and political economy then might appear to be about emphasizing the distribution side of this picture and engaging the, with values and um, politics in those questions. So I'm going to say um, that this paper is about kind of breaking down that frame and um, switching the, the picture just so that the idea of efficiency that is commonly, as it's commonly presented in law schools, it's a logic that rationalizes catastrophic destruction of resources, natural resources, social, human, political, democratic resources, legal capacity, I would say, and um, as well as actual economic material resources. Even, even if you think of it as focused on financial maximizing, the evidence doesn't suggest that maximizing in the, the idea of looking at a quantity, aggregate quantity of gain tells you anything about whether actually there's a societal gain or loss in any meaningful sense. Um, and so this is this misleading logic here um, that is the standard story, kind of background story in a lot of uh, legal education, I think, is that if we have a bigger pie, well, then it'll be easier to meet the many distributed conflicting needs that are out there in interest. So thanks. And but honestly, the politics of distribution, all the conflicts about the race, class, gender, also implicate a politics of production. 
what do we mean by the economic pie? Um, now, the, of course, historically, the idea of the economic pie versus the things outside of that pie, as Angela and others, like Noah Sachs and, and Amy Kaczynski have written in an LPE blog article, you know, all of that is subject to lots of uh, already politics and conflicts around gender, class, et cetera. Um, so I think my point here is, is in part that um, however we if, we, if we talk about um, the, the social side of things, the social and environmental goals as something outside of the economic, as something other than economic growth and economic production, then it, if it's if if it's about consuming the pie rather than making the pie, already there's a disadvantage. So I'm kind of resisting the idea of a safety net or even a social floor as a way of talking about addressing inequality and some of the other uh, social goals. Now, um, so this, this distinction between production and social reproduction has changed dramatically over the years in different ways. It's a fluid line of line that's full of, of um, instrumental politics. Um, let's, so, um, oops, economists Nancy Fulbright and James Heinz um, have a, a number of studies about the distinction between social and economic and the way in which we drop out our thinking about what is productive labor. 50% of the labor time in their calculation is takes place outside of formal market categories and um, at a tr potentially tremendous value, even within the standard measures of GDP and a quantitative analysis of economic gain. But I think more provocatively, they said that we shouldn't think of this as, um, as it's it's not just a personal or, or even public good. It's it's an economic investment that um, it's a, it's not consumption. It's not it's it's not even an exchange of resources between the worker and the um, and the. The um, the firm or the employer. It's a it's about an investment with immense potential for positive spillover effects that extend broadly beyond families and over generations. It's not this kind of social production work. It's not um, a raw input. Fulbright and Heinz say, for example, it doesn't. It's not something. The idea that that production is about taking raw materials and putting them into some so the final form and then marketing them is a kind of deceptive image because even nature is something that is produced in interaction with human life with many species. It's an ongoing interactive changing um, set of resources. And so the interdependency here of, um, of the things that take place outside the market and the actual production that is um, identified with the market is much more complex than we typically recognize. So, and and um, the kind of need of banks is someone who's written about, for example, the uh, social in social economic investment work that happens um, typically among Black women in, engaged in all kinds of community activism and mutual aid work as production. Kavlina Chernova, um, another economist, writes about how a jobs guarantee that provides um, federally funded jobs for care for climate, community, and people, how that would not just be consumption, but an investment that has amazing, I mean, incredible and incalculable spillover positive effects in, in the economy and society in all kinds of ways. Now, I think other things that um, we think of of social trust, democracy, um, human health, the, the many earth systems, not just climate, but the nitrogen cycle, the soil, the, the microbiomes, the ways in which 
um, human activity affects those for good and ill, and the, the far reaching economic um, effects of that. So, what is the economy? It's not just that a problem that non commodified goods are excluded, but even what do we really count as a commodified gain or loss? The idea that the economy requires ontological assumptions. Who is the subject of the economy? Do we imagine the economy as an aggregate of formal individual self interest maximizers? Or as Martha Feynman suggests, should we imagine the economy as comprised of and for humans? And what are humans as an ontological subject uh, matter? Humans are substantive, never formal. We're, we're all in universally, inevitably embodied and embedded in a particular, differently situated, unique social um, condition, social position. So, what is that? Um, that gender, that means that the gender um, understanding of the division between economic and social, it's not just an, 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 um, about the distribution of particular resources from one group to the other, from men versus women, for example. It shapes how we imagine economic production. As a, well, as a realm where socially valuable power is conceptually detached from human substantive well being. Um, and the impact of that division, I think, is, is particularly, um, it, it's a central um, problem when you think of labor and workers, because workers can never fully divide their social and personal and bodily needs from their work needs. And, and here I'm, um, um, citing a accrediting a discussion that, that Diana uh, Reddy had with um, our appeal group on asking the question, how can we rethink um, workers' lot, legal, political, and economic power in the public interest rather than just as a means to another interest? I wrote a, um, an article a few years ago that I, I think I circulated for this conference um, on are we economic engines True. So in that article, I explored economic productivity as an idea steeped in ideology and identi identity. The metaphors of 19th century, um, early 20th century uh, industrial power uh, are steeped in images of race, gender, um, empire. And they're about, if you think of, um, I know there's a lot of railroads. Um, Stories here, but um, I'm thinking of the recent um, the, the recent railroad um, disaster in East Pal and East Palestine um, as a an example of the extraction of, of both um, the workers as laborers themselves, the, the settlement of the a recent worker the railroad worker strike that um, was about uh, basically denying the uh, seven days of sick leave, paid sick leave for work. For the railroad workers, and also a, a kind of um, uh, incentive, a, a big train um, production strategy that, that added a lot of safety risks and at the same time carried carbon, uh, the, the big increase in these big trains and, and train hazards and railroad issues about the, um, the um, ramp up of oil and gas production. And the, the the shift from the industrial worker, again, I have symbolized here with the um, with the Uber self-driving car, the shift in productivity, no longer the um, the strong masculine worker that's the emblem of productivity. It's it's the post-human um, uh, robot, or even I mean, at the same time, the knowledge worker. But the knowledge worker is designed, is relegated to various gig economy jobs. Um, so anyway, th this. Um, the, the productive worker poses a problem for the liberal and neoliberal idea of reciprocal market contracts for mutual gain. Human workers act as agents producing external gain as well as personal well-being, but contractual relations can never separate the two. So law corrects this moral hazard uh, market failure 
for restrictions on workers' authority and increased personal risk, the cost of living, uh, um, restrictive social safety net, fiscal and monetary policies, as well as um, structures of work that um, that basically create work as an unequal legal relationship with unequal rights to coordinate between the firm, for example, and unions. Cox disease socialism is another manifestation of criticism that the Standard Center um, recently publicized about the idea that the more we increase care support, the social reproduction support, the more that will um, produce demand that increases further um, costs of supporting care and ends up encroaching the, the idea of this sort of support for social reproduction as um, as a threat to the productive economy. It's going to be an increasing share. It's going to distort the, um, the incentives that um, keep the economy going. Therefore, um, so, um, social reproductive labor has to be cheap and risky. So instead, I draw on the um, I. No, I, I think we should think of this as a moral opportunity, a way to rethink um, the way to rethink what productive economy is here. And I'm drawing here on um, uh, in time, Sebastian Berger and a critical accounting theorist, Fox Richard, who have a, um, revived some earlier political economic work on accounting to say, how do we misconceive social, so-called social costs? The damages at, at both the firm level and the national, international level, accounting standards are effectively designed to conserve financial capital and deplete human social and ecological assets. This practice was established in the Middle Ages in Florence, Italy with the idea that the only debts that should have to be paid, the only assets that need to be preserved are purely financial. And that, that um, at both the uh, firm level and the macro level, the gains that are recognized in accounting um, are basically um, represent systemic cost shifting, hidden costs, unpaid costs, basically incentiv incentivizing waste, fraud, and unequal costs. Law adopts accounting standards that insulate producers from responsibility from the hazards of production, the dangers, the damages of production. And most of those damages don't fit the idea of marginal costs out of my thinking um, that we're used to thinking about. So I, this, we're talking about damages here that are incommensurable, synergistic, nonlinear, like tipping points like climate, irreversible non-reciprocal, entropic, cumulative, institutionally caused, they cannot be conceptualized as externalities. They're internal to the system. They, they can't be fixed as an Eclosian framework through uh, adding property rights and contract rights to, in, to reduce transaction costs. Instead, they propose a system of full real cost accounting that from the beginning, Shapes property and rights and basic legal um, um, access to gains and to doing business um, with an accounting that recognizes the human and environmental and social damage. Well, thank you. So uh, thanks very much uh, for the invitation and the organizers. I'm really thrilled to be on this panel. I think there's some really nice synergies with uh, Samir's idea of prefigurative, prefigurative transformation or transformative imagination and Martha's fundamental call for reconceptualizing how we think of uh, production away from the individualist and materialist towards a more social and individual subject. So I hope this come up. Maybe in the discovery. So um, our, our project is called Deconstructing Class Analysis. And the basic idea is that, as we all understand, understanding the articulation of class with racialization and gender, always an important uh, priority on the left is more urgent today than ever. And it's also a W on Harry Knows, a very fraught undertaking. Nancy Fraser's recent presidential address of the American Philosophical Association and the debate around it show that. One source of the difficulty we think might stem from 
two flaws in the dominant conception of class that has been handed down from Marxism, the dominant conception of class handed down from Marxism, to enter into dialogues with uh, the Black radical and feminist traditions. One is uh, an undue focus on material production, and the other is on the working class as a like privileged agent of change. So what our effort here is twofold. One, we want to build on a dissident strain within Marxian analysis to offer a reconceptualization of class away from the dominant Marxist intention. And then two, embed that analysis of class within an analysis of capitalist dynamics to show how it generates racialized capitalism and articulates with gender divisions of labor both in and outside the market. So that's the overall frame of the project. And so our conception of class, the reconceptualization of class, has basically uh, three fundamental elements. They're linked. The first is that class is, of course, a sort of relation. That should be obvious, but it's important to emphasize just how fundamentally that cuts against the dominant conventional ideas of class within liberal or Bavarian mainstream sociology would see class and individualist terms as about opportunity and social mobility, which is fundamentally different than the notion of class and relation. Second, we understand class to be a social, an asymmetrical social relation of production, going both to the division of labor and the disposition of its fruits. And this is against, we claim, who suggest a dominant strain of Marxism that, that tends to focus on class, it, orienting it around notions of material production of a surplus. And uh, our view is that it's uh, the, the, there's a dissonance in Marxism that needs to be recovered and revived. Finally, and perhaps somewhat most controversially, we want to insist that class is, of course, an alienating and exploitative relationship, uh, an oppressive social relation that has to be transformed. And because it has to be transformed, we have to be guarding against the idea of seeing class as a fixed identity of a certain group, the working class, that is to be valorized and championed in this current state. Because the whole point is we're trying to transform a relation, and we have to understand that the relation forms people. And as such, if we want to transform the relation, we are going to transform those of us who have been formed by that relation. So, um, Okay, so if that's the case. I'm just going to say a bit more about the alternative conception of class that we want to offer to the dominant Marxist. So, in the Marxist division, the dominant conception of class is to foresee it as a social structure. But within that conception, there's two very different notions of that structure. The dominant one overwhelmingly is to see class as a social relation anchored in differential ownership of the forces of production. Within capitalism, there are those who own nothing but their own labor and must work for a living, and there are those who can hire labor because they own means of production and they can live off the labor of others. This sets up the binary labor capital class conflict, and that's the dominant uh, conception. But that dominant conception we suggest is ultimately implausible because it's anchored in an untenable notion of material production of a surplus. And this has deep roots in the dominant conception of Marxism, but there is this dissident strand of Marxism. And I just want to say a couple of words about that dissident strand uh, by way of three slogans. So the dominant strand of Marxism is a materialist conception of history. An alternative view is that we should adopt a historicist conception of materialism. Meaning, the dominant strand of Marxism projects what are historically specific social relations and dynamics of capitalism, the domination of so-called material factors onto all of history and society, whereas the proper fundamental unit of analysis isn't material forces, but social relations. And social relations, if they're the fundamental unit, have to always be historicized. So historical specificity and social relations are the fundamental guiding lights, I think, and we think, of the you know, dissident strain of Marxism that we're uh, building on. Carl Korsch, political Marxism, Ellen Wood, value form theory, Isaac Rudin, Diane Elson. This dissonance strand is not historical materialism. It's a social historicism. It's a fundamentally different way of analyzing society and history. Second, it's not the labor theory of value. It's the value theory of labor. The point is that labor and utility, human needs and powers are shaped by being subject to the value form, ceaseless exchange value, efficiency for its own sake. 
under capitalism. And that's the problem. The problem is changing the social relation, not worrying only about the redistribution from capital to labor. And that gets the, the, the third conception, which is class isn't just about the material production of some surplus and its distribution. It's about an alienating and exploitative division of labor, which needs to be transformed. And both the division of labor and the disposition of its fruits need to be subject to a social transformation. And how that works within capitalism is to generate not just one, but two fundamental axes, ownership of assets and the division of labor, which then within capitalist dynamics, generate a third constitutive feature, which is racialization, and then how that interacts with gender is what we're present here. Okay, so reading from left to right, uh, this is our basic model uh, uh, that we're trying to extract. Uh, um, <clears throat> we start with the twin engines of uh, capitalist social relations being market dependence for subsistence and market dependence for resources in production, which is to say most people live in households that depend on market to satisfy their basic needs and wants. And most organizers of production depend on markets to acquire the basic resources they need to stay in organizing production rather than fall out and be declassed. In combination, these form the phenomenon of generalized markets or market as imperative rather than opportunity um, uh, that we think of as the red queen dynamic. Here you have to run as fast as you can just to stay in place. To get anywhere you need to try, you need to run twice as fast as that. The twice as fast as that takes two primary paths, describing two distinctive features of capitalism. The first is continuous improvement in order to get enough ahead of the competition to create stable quasi rents for long enough to extract profits. This is Schumpeter channeling Marx on the core driving increased productivity as a mechanism of seeking power over potential competitors and, and, and getting a bit of a break from the Red Queen dynamic. But the second is sheer direct power to exploit using institutions, using technology. And for in Verle, we, we accept that organizations are basically indifferent between business sabotage and improvement, whichever gives them enough profit for breathing room um, uh, is, what they're, uh, is what they're looking for. And it's from that that we get the particular structure of exploitation that is so characteristic of capitalism, which since the beginning of modernity no longer is supported by direct coercion legitimated through religion and custom, but rather through a, a bit hidden behind a veil of commodified exchange, free exchange between juridically equal, uh, uh, between formerly juridical equals. It's that political legitimating form that creates the continuous pursuit and desire to racialize, to identify fissures within, broadly speaking, the working class that we'll talk in a little bit about the three major functions um, uh, they play in order to intensify exploitation without triggering revolt. Because all of these are inherited from conflict, not from some natural set of orders. In combination, the incessant pursuit of productivity and the incessant pursuit of exploitation lead to this fundamental characteristic of alienation of social powers uh, and relations, ceaseless expansion of exchange value for its own sake, subsuming human needs and powers, human relations, and the earth in extensive and intensive instrumentalization. That's the core uh, dynamic. Power seeking, in other words, is the animating spirit of capitalism. It buys both productivity and exploitation, drive both at productivity and the particular patterns of exploitation and alienation. And we break it down in the paper and we can go on with that towards the staying power and withholding power. What can I do? How much power do I have to avoid the commodified exchange? What is it that I have control over within the exchange, which together produce my bargaining 
And these are all based on inherited institutions, ideologies, and technologies from prior rounds of conflict and exchange. And these are basically along three major dimensions property and the needs of subsistence and resources in production, the division of labor, particularly between cognitive and manual, or skilled and unskilled. Critically, the quantum of hard to replace embodied knowledge that can't be fully expropriated through a property relation but occurs within the body of the working person. And finally, recognition as in fact the full juridical purpose that means that capitalism produces and leverages racialization all the time. And here we really focus on the fact uh, that we really try to work this through Du Bois's black reconstruction in detail with relatively long quotations and emphasizing Robinson's focus on the fact that racialization <laughs> emerges in European early capitalism before the weeping of Africa, and then gets applied to it because it's central to always be looking for that. Then it gets articulated with gender in partly in leveraging and restructuring uh, uh, gender subordination for labor and partly of the deprivatization of reproduction, as Martha was discussing with, with Nancy Polder. Both of these, we claim, are not things that are added to class on top of the model of capitalism, but are constitutive of the very theory of class as derived from this model of the dynamics of capital. As Kala said, this results in these three dimensions, and essentially at a broad level, they, they give us these six core classes uh, along these three dimensions of tension. There are tiers of all property, but don't do work. The capitalists who own property and do managerial work, the professional managerial class who do managerial cognitive work but don't have property in the um, uh, 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 project, the smallholders who own some property enough to give themselves some independence from others, enough to give themselves some space but do the work, the working classes who have uh, who do the manual labor but are themselves internally divided between the unskilled and the skilled, which is a phenomenon that repeats throughout the history of, of, of these relations and the production of a racialized underclass articulated with gender subordination. This is the core. Important for us is that in the last 40 years, the central dynamic has been that the professional and managerial class has expanded its control over the growth in income at the expense of the working classes for sure, but also the smallholders, also the rentiers, also some of the capitalists, and certainly and most intensively the racialized underclass and gendered uh, uh, subordinated labor, following the formal inclusion in juridical equality in 64, 65, and, and any response to the women's. So these are these that come out of this analysis as distinct classes are the two most important classes to understand this distinct components for the understanding of us religions. Here again, we just are taking straight out of, of, of Du Bois and Robinson, three major functions um, uh, for, for racialization in capitalist social relations. The first is creating and, and, and exploiting and producing and reproducing a super exploitable underclass whose distinctive merit is that super exploiting it will not trigger revolt in the normative working class, that is to say, in the white working class. That's and so, and that's critical, obviously, to arbitrage globally now. And this is straight again out of the boys, arbitraging globally, particularly exploitable um, um, groups. It produces the stagnant and latent reserve army of labor to produce a fundamental pressure on all of the working class. And it's a divide and conquer strategy to prevent the, the collation of economic and political power. With gender, we see it articulating in two distinctive ways related to two distinctive uh, uh, literatures. One, based primarily on feminist economic historians, is the long history, and here we, we, we build an Ivy Pinch text work from 1930 and, and major. Um, um, uh, location since then. Women as a status subordinated labor subject to super explanation denied full recognition of the full juridical person exactly like it operates in racialization. 
And we tried to briefly go through the five major regimes in capitalism since the Industrial Revolution and identify the integration of women and children, married women, unmarried women, but also um, um, uh, enslaved Black workers, racialized immigrants of various forms in various ways, and how we square all the way back up to Erin Hatton's work that Martha uh, talks about in her um, uh, uh, paper of integrating married women and leveraging the changing um, uh, norms uh, for uh, in order to produce um, um, uh, the new fissured, uncertain, unstable relations that characterize services industry around, in each case, men controlling the remaining vestiges of high quality, whether it's in the first industrial revolution with men remaining primarily in crafts and women being the ones who are the primary workforce in the new factory alienated uh, models, or whether it's women into the services in the future, and, and this is the tech economy and the tech girls uh, story. The second is Nancy Fulber's long-standing work that, that Martha talked about, which focuses not on subordinated labor, but on the privatization of reproduction and care work as the central driving force distinctive to capitalism, because patriarchy is not unique, needless to say, to capitalism, but the distinctive, but the distinctive role in capitalism of the privatization of care work is to both, because of the uh, uh, double uh, shift, is to both subordinate women in commodified work and to subordinate women within patriarchal relations because of the valorization of paid work and commodified work. So that it pays both on the question of, of, of in commodified labor and in non But what we learned going all the way back to Ella Baker and Marvel Cook in the Bronx slave market in 1930 and Claudia Jones and, and, and uh, uh, more recently uh, uh, Angela Davis, that articulates back with the racialized class structure and the racialized underclass by this systematic uh, leveraging of racialization into the commodified labor. So what essentially you get is, is externalization of the patriarchal relation within uh, the family subject to capitalism by commodifying some of the work using uh, hyper-exploitable um, um, racialized underclass of black and brown women doing the work. Leaving us programmatically with the critical most important transformative move being partial decommodification of basic needs and goods to disrupt to disrupt the core driver of capitalist dynamics, which is to say market dependence for subsistence. And this we see in the freedom budget with ranging from the universal jobs guarantee to the uh, 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 health, education, housing. Uh, we just saw it with, with, with Ayanna Presley's uh, push to do the same thing with Derek Hamilton doing a lot of work on wealth-based progressivity in order to speed up and have a race forward strategy version of this universal partial decommodification. And on the side of, of prioritizing with gender, it's the cradle to great socialized care, either by unionized public economy employees or sector-wide wage and settings, but in any event, socialization through the tax system as the foundational um, um, uh, intervention, and here essentially we, we do this through the, the, the quotation of Angela Davis's conclusion to her women, race, and class, which is precisely focused on this one. I'll take the first question, but be prepared um, for all of you to be called on or to volunteer as you want. <laughs> Um, just to get you all going, um, I thought it was a pretty clear account of the role that law plays, um, but I want to ask just a sort of a baseline question about what extent um, is capitalism, is, the, is um, racial subordination, gender subordination, the intersection of it, the goal or uh, right, capitalism as, as its goal, 
or is it an instrumental byproduct? So does, do these things stand outside of, and is uh, gender and racialized subordination something that we have to worry about no matter the system? Do we worry about it more in this particular context? So there's a, um, a set of themes within the papers in, in, uh, and on the, on the panel around um, reimagination and reconceptualization, but trying to understand, well, what is the underlying target of that reconceptualization and reimagination as it affects um, racial subordination? Is it really capitalism because that's its end goal is to produce that racial subordination and gender subordination? Or is it the byproduct of it that we're trying to address um, and redress? Uh, so do you mind um, thinking about that and, and engaging with one another or whatever it is that you want to talk about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I'm not sure I understand the, I mean, you're saying if, Racialized subordination or gender subordination is the goal of capitalism, then it makes sense to what focus on the transform capitalism as a strategy for attacking these forms of subordination. Is that the idea? Yeah, it was just trying to understand how you um conceive the relationship between between the two, right? Between capitalism and race, just sort of as a baseline. So as a baseline matter, we sort of say at the outset that ours is not an attempt to provide a theory of racialized subordination or gender subordination. There are different debates within the black radical tradition about racialization, about about this new case for capitalism, which is sort of specificity of colonialism versus going back much further. And similarly, of course, patriarchy, everything there's not even a debate too much between capitalism, whether it precedes class society is new thing. So, I mean, I, I don't have the view that the three are causally unified and therefore attacking capitalist social relations is the way to attack gender and race by subordination is implicit. Ours is about how transforming capitalist social relations will also transform the ways in which capitalism racializes and gender subordination. Of course, that's not a guarantee that other forms of anti racist. And feminist work will not also be part of the program. But yes, all exactly. Okay. I guess I, I'm interested in thinking about how particular legal um, and political framings of, of pieces of capitalism, like accounting, like the the, the structures of, of the labor relation and division between economic and social, how those accelerate. Um, systems and, and create almost their own like incentivized um, spirals of increasing subordination along other lines. That's, that's certainly not to say that other economic systems or legal systems are free of uh, subordination in any way, shape, or form, but it, it's just that we really have to look at the way in which there's a kind of rationalization and um, and systematic and, and, and denial of responsibility, insulation of um, accountability and responsibility, and it becomes its own um, uh, reward. Like it's, it's a reward system that it's really hard to escape individually because of the way it's systematized and um, so on. Uh, and I'll just say that I think that. Um... I think the question is interesting, but um, somewhat, well, uh, obviously academic um, in the sense that um, people face um, various forms of economic subordination on the ground. Um, uh, and um, they do it, I think, when we take a step back, we see that we untangle what's happening and we see that they're a racialized underclass in, 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 in the words of Yochai and uh, Tala. Um, but um, I'm not sure that they experience it that way. They nearly experience economic discrimination um, of different kinds. And um, certainly, um, capitalism has created a consciousness that accentuates both racial and gender subordination. That consciousness exists, as Martha just said, in and out of capitalism. Um, 
I think there's like, I think one of the papers talked about uh, uh, sort of uh, a subordination, gender and racial subordination in um, command economies or socialist economies, right? Um, so it's not like you uh, undo that consciousness by taking on parts of capitalism and engaging in some foundational, you know, kind of uh, revolutionary reform potentially. Um, that consciousness still lives. Um, and, uh, but again, I, 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 I'm not sure that how it's experienced actually on the ground, um, you know, is, is kind of informed by delineating, figuring out what came first um, is, is just my contribution. I will say just one thing. Is though not intended to solve everything, if one could in fact transform a system that produces immiseration for tens of millions of people because of its own dynamics, it's good enough. Not good enough for all of races. That's not what I mean. It's worth doing, is what I mean. Yes. Please. Uh, thank you, Dina. Uh, and you go to go in Australia. I have predictably enough question for you. Hi, Tawa. The first question is if you could name names a little bit in terms of the orthodox view of class within Marxism, because I some of the arguments I was like, oh yeah, sure, that's how I would explain it to my students in five minutes. But then if I had 20 minutes, I wouldn't say something <laughs> so stupid. Um so for example, I was really stupid. <laughs> I was trying to get out of this point very quickly. <laughs> I was surprised, for example, not to see in the dissident or in the order of post, like for Nicole Plunza's uh, capitalism and social classes, partly because it thinks about production not simply as material production, right? So I was I was wondering, like, what are the names? And the second point, I wanted to push a little bit back against, like, the professional managerial class and the way you understand it, in the sense that, like, I'm wondering if that's also a good place to start thinking about performing functions of capital and how and to what extent it is in tension with performing wage labor. Like, I'm thinking, for example, if you teach property at Harvard Law School as tenured, I think you're a member of the professional manager class for a number of reasons. If you teach property as an adjunct faculty um, in somewhere else, I think it starts becoming much more unclear to what extent you have benefited from the pie from the redistribution of incomes in relationship to everyone else, right? Actually, I think you inhabit a very different class, but at the same time, you are performing partially functions of capital because you're teaching property. So I was wondering if that's a slightly undifferentiated um, ideal class, the miss of the deterioration and the, so, like the subordination uh, of part of a professional managerial class in um, the workplace that actually merits its own separate thinking. So, I mean, you know, going back to all of classical Marxism, to G.A. Cohen, to G.P.M. de Santa Claus, to Eric Holden Wright, okay. right? <laughs> All of these traditions, right? Basically, understand class to be about ownership of the forces of production, which split into a binary between labor and capital. I mean, that's like overwhelmingly the dominant tradition within Marxism, but overwhelmingly. Then there's a brilliant dissident tradition, a minor tradition with value form theory and Carl Fort and Lubin and Diana Nelson and these folks. Okay. And but that's a very, I think, dissident tradition. And so I'm sorry, I can't speak to Kulan's ass at the moment, just off the top of my head, what his conception of class and classes and capitalism is. I just it's not and I don't know. But, but, but I mean, uh, I don't think I'm the Althusserian tradition is different in this respect. So, I mean, this isn't a belief from Marxian analysis. This is an attempt to recover and develop and build out what I consider to be a sort of unrepresentative strand. And so today, you know, I mean, the 
the debates that happen within Marxism and the new left or new lately are all still operating with this conception of class. If you have all the debates on both sides, Matt Carr, Bill and Roddy, Robert Brander, they all have this conception of class. The one that we're that you're calling stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. I didn't call that. <laughs> um, on the question of, of how to describe the PMC, um, here's the basic thing. Uh, we don't want to end up falling on just descriptivism. Let me let me do a sociology of this and that, and then you end up with this Durkheimian uh, uh, view of class where every every uh, uh, every um, um, job classification becomes a class. So the question is, how do you trade off analytic parsimony and descriptive parsimony for capturing the most important dynamics? The way in which we deal specifically with the split that you're talking about, we've tried two things. One was to layer a fourth dimension of authority on the model that, that Eric Olin Wright tried however many 30 years ago, uh, and then to introduce the foreman, et cetera. Where we are now, again, with the effort to reduce the dimensions um, um, is to think of it in terms of the level of ability to basically to, to, to your, your staying power and your withholding power, how easy or hard it is to come in. And here within the professional managerial class, we see a distinction between what we're calling the professional managerial class and the clerical class or the, the paraprofessional class, which in turn has its own, particularly it's uh, uh, in, in the middle of the, from the middle of the 20th century with its own internal gender dynamic that then generates not only white color, but pink color work that leverages both of these so that you can, you can along the dimension of what we're doing now is, 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 is skilled, unskilled, manual cognitive, one could instead talk about it as, as two dimensions of manual cognitive and, and but we're really focused on the source of power and the source of power here there is embodied knowledge and that's where we're but we completely see but as within the working classes the skilled and the unskilled and proud we see within the professional managerial class those who are there's there are real internal spits and the whole point of having these class descriptions is to try to identify systematic potential allies that are um, surprising. Hey, Antal, I guess I'm just thinking about um, how do you think about racialized knowledge extraction, given that a lot of the ideas is like looking at Community work and organizing work and sort of this knowledge, this idea that oftentimes black women that are in the organizing are the ones that are putting their bodies on the line and having to do a lot of work. Academics come in, we look to their ideas, we don't actually compensate them for anything, and we get to like have better informed academic analysis. So I guess I'm just curious how do you think about extracting knowledge into academia? I kept on looking mostly at Tamir, but I think for anybody that wants to take it. I, I think that's a particular um, danger um, in the context of clinical legal ed as well, um, where we are, uh, we could be at worst um, sort of um, anthropologists engaged in field work um, for the benefit of our students um, and perhaps as faculty for you know our security of employment and other other things all self-interested motives driving community engagement which is a danger of any edi community engagement ship, which we see at all of our universities current um and so then the question is how do you remain uh vigilant um i mean one thing that i've i've i've, I've um, come around to is the idea that idea generation is not in one direction or visioning is not in one direction. And the question is, how do we equip ourselves with the capacity to engage in real, you know, relationships with the organizers with whom we work, as well as, you know, members of the base of organizations with whom we work, uh, how do we prepare ourselves to engage in, 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 in relationships that might be generative for the collaboration 
um, the joint collaboration that we might and what might we produce from from that. That's really what I'm trying to get at um, in the paper is that there's a responsibility that we have, and I would say it's easier to do that in clinical legal education because you have a context in which you're actually trying to achieve something uh, for the people that you're collaborating with. I think it's harder for pure academics who, who don't have necessarily have that joint project, although many people I know, um, some of whom are in the room actually you know, give as much as they can take and that there is a true exchange um, with the groups that they collaborate with in the course of doing their scholarship. Um, but I, I, the, the only thing I could say is, is, is vigilance and a degree of preparation um, and a kind of responsibility that we carry as, 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 as different kinds of academics. Thank you, this, this is wonderful. Um, I was thinking about, um, starting with um, Tal and Yafai's paper, but also for all of you, how do we think about dynamics of racialization um, and gendering? Um, not, well, that, like, I was thinking about Angela's paper talking about Johnson v. Macintosh, case that we all know well, right? Where racialization is actually intrinsic to the formation of property and what constitutes property in the fee simple, right, itself. Um, those of us who study intellectual property are familiar with critiques that, that what constitutes intellectual property itself is itself informed by the racialized ideas about what kinds of knowledge are um, compensable and worthy of protection and what kinds of right? Um, in the context of gender, I would say like um, Noah Zatz's work about what counts as work um, written through the welfare state, but also in the form of contact right? that's, that's diffused with gender. And so this is, I guess, to say there are there seem to be elements of racialization and, and, and <clears throat> the construction of gender that are kind of shot through these categories of like where is proprietorship, um, where is ownership, like what is capital, what is not, and that don't only operate in the sense of status relations that um, allow um, subordinated classes to be or super subordinated classes, right? And so I'm just curious if. How, you know, any of you want to sort of comment on sort of how do we talk about the ways that the ideas and the process of racialization and gendering operate throughout these different class formations as opposed to only um, maybe a status sort of sorting between them? Um, question. Good. Good question. I think we just constantly, I mean, and that's where I think critical engagement with um, grassroots movements can sometimes help to kind of open up new ways of, of, of thinking about it. And I, but it's a, just a question that should always be on the table. That's the critical, critical analysis. So, so. In this very condensed 40 page paper, uh, we, we, we only gesture towards it, but you're absolutely right that these dimensions of subordination play a central role in, right? The, the struggle is across all of these directions. It's across the institutions and therefore the law, it's across the ideologies and the organizations, it's across the, the, the technologies. So here, for example, we just, a um, um, uh, gesture toward the role of, um, um, uh, so, so Holly Brewer's paper from, from a year or so ago on, on, on the role of, of um, debt and foreclosure in the conflicts of the imperial common law of, Britain, of, of, of England and then Britain to get to the point of actually taking race and particularly African descent as the dividing line between people who can be property and people who can't. And, and she really works through about 60 or so years worth of conflict and back and forth based on the political economy of an England between absolutism and, and, and a parliamentary system that ends up resolving into this us then here there as the distinction that allows treating people as property out there in the colonies, but not here in England, that only those people who are of African descent, not those of others, and that then becomes property. 
Um, similarly, I think uh, I think Martha's paper actually has more of the spirit of what Evan Hatton's Kelly Girls to Permatense has. Uh, but it's exactly what 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 Hatton does in that book is exactly showing in detail how the tent industry deployed rapidly changing conceptions of gender and gender roles in the family to normalize new unstable exploitative relations of labor as what well counts as labor, what doesn't count as labor, who's a worker, who's not a worker, what counts as, as, as um, uh, exploitative labor. Um, um, um. So, so she, and she goes, in the 50s, it's all this cheerful white woman who is a married woman who's on the side a little bit making a little bit of pocket money. Then they get wise. It's a shame that you didn't have that ever, never on your, on your, that, that, that you rushed through. But just the way in which over the course of the 70s, this shifts into the dependent woman who, and you see completely consistent with Nancy Fraser's sense of the, of the cunning of, of history. Uh, uh, as as neoliberalism absorbs some of this, you just see how these changing conceptions of women's role and their independence changes in each case to work around union objection to the casualization of labor and uh, increased precarity. Uh, and so, yes, in all of these, in each one of these, these relative weaknesses and these dynamics are continuously pushing to find fissures, to find places where you can actually distort relations in a way that will be not sufficient to trigger uh, a, a large enough and powerful enough revolution. Say two at a time. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I just first want to say thank you so much for this panel because it really is like so much theoretical clarification for me. And I just want to have a couple of questions, one for Martha, one for Sarah, about moving forward, because there is formulations that really stuck with me. Um, uh, Martha, with your formulation of moving from thinking about we, we face the problem of maldistribution, one of mass destruction, I think, and particularly the same with Nina Banks on activism and productivity, I'm wondering, do you think that there is room with an existing quantitative analysis of productivity? To refine these measures, because I know Paul Ray herself uh, tried to refine measures of productivity and said that like, British GDP would be double if you found some care work that's not compensated. Or do we need to move beyond the sort of quantification to say, don't count the costs, like this is really, uh, or, or these quantitatively uh, focused fields are hopelessly colonized by um, uh, irredeemable uh, mindsets you know, about, about, the, about, the, about the nature of value. And my question for Samir is, I mean, I was really struck by your recharacterization of the problem, uh, reframing the problem of wage theft to one of racialized labor extraction, extraction. And I'm wondering in terms of like, where you see the future of scholarship there, might it be more comparative to say, here are more communities that do not involve labor extraction, might it be historical in terms of how this thing just as well in the past. I'm just wondering about your next steps for each of these projects. But you said one more question. Um, thank you all for these really rich panels. Um, Mira, my question for you was just was if you could tell us why it's prefigurative. What do you, what does that what should we how should we conceive of prefigurative politics that are impacted in the classroom? Um, and then for Martha and Yokai and uh, Frontella, I'm sort of curious about um, given that um, well, especially for um, Yokai and and Pella, given that you're drawing on the black radical tradition, it seems like organized violence is a critical piece of how they're thinking. And so how does incarceration and militarism fit into it? And it's interesting that you are citing to April Randall's freedom budget, which so ironically, you know, says, you know, this will not disturb the military budget at the end of the pamphlet, right? And so just thinking about how and these are obviously race-making practices, right? Incarceration and militarism. So how does that fit into um, the frameworks that you offer us? Um, I, I, one thing I want to say in response to Amy's question is just it, it struck me and maybe I'm uh, hearing what I want to hear, but as a kind of master schools question, um, you know, um, and uh, so I just, you know, the insight from critical race theory is that you use the resources that you have um, 
to avert um, uh, uh, further subordination and create space. Um, so I did want to say that um, in response to that question, although again, I may be answering a question that I wanted rather than the one that I'm trying to ask. <laughs> Don't we all do it all the time? <laughs> I'm, just, right. I'm just saying in terms of prefiguration, this is a, you know, something I didn't get to in, when I, in the talk, but um, I think what we're trying to uh, focus on is the solidarity uh, in which the workers engage. Um, it may be a product of the time. It, you know, many people said the pandemic is a portal. Um, this was an instance in which there was a, a degree of labor market tightness, perhaps, that allowed for uh, the kind of a solidaristic uh, withholding, uh, in, the, in the words of uh, uh, my co-panelists, um, withholding power that they possess. And then the question is with our students is, how do we characterize that? How do we not write a complaint that's about the terminations and about the power of the employer vis-a-vis -vis the employee, but instead is about the solidarity that was exhibited and demonstrated by, by this group of workers? That's what I think is prefigurative. And it's important to imbue legalism, even liberal legalism, with some sense of possibility. Um, uh, kind of act, people acting as if conditions were or are altered. Um, and frankly, with regard to racialized labor extraction, oftentimes my thoughts go to immigration law and my frustration with immigration legal discourse, which acts as if you know, all of immigration law is about post before the nation of immigrants rhetoric and doesn't really, is not um, uh, tied back uh, to uh, the kind of histories of exclusion that have animated immigration law. Um, and uh, I think we, we, we teach our students uh, to be uh, basically penal bureaucrats working in an immigration system, either on behalf of immigrants or uh, for the government uh, deporting people. And I think racialized labor extraction gives a broader theoretical critique of migration, you know, regulation of migration um, in a way that is much more deeply true than the way in which you talk about immigration on most platforms at most students. Can I just make sure I've got the question? You were asking about organized violence, and I guess in particular with respect to the car sports grid and the Yeah. Yeah, as race making practices, given that you're sort of right. that's favoring okay. your right. So, so that's wonderful. And so this might sound overly reductive, but I understand organized violence within capitalism, both domestically and globally, to simultaneously always already be disposed of uh, at, at the disposal of two different functions. So one is just internal to the system, dealing with the vertical racialized relations that it generates of a racialized underclass and then the policing of it and the incarceration of it and you know, the fiscal crisis of the state, the whole literature on that. So that's one. And so, and then the other is, always at the disposal of when it's needed to put down any challenges to the system as a whole, right? So you, uh, American labor history is one of the most violent in, in, in capitalist countries because it's always there, and of course, uh, uh, obviously much more so if you want to, uh, with respect to Point Delpro, Black Panthers, everything like any sort of politicized, uh, so I see it in those two roles, internal to the system, dealing with the effects of racialized uh, super exploitation and then reproducing the system. And I think well, it's identical. I think uh, you see the use of American military, military power, at least since, I guess, the Philippines in the early part of the century, as basically always already either about reproducing um, markets, labor, uh, resources, available on super exploitative extractive terms or putting down national revolts, uh, you know, Guatemala, uh, Iran, Vietnam, everywhere, which threaten the hegemony of the system. And so that's like sort of how I see it. And, you know, the, the you know, brilliant explication of how it worked uh, in Pakistan today. I mean, I have to think about how that relates because it, it be there just for, you know, reproduce kind of Comprador relationship with a very complicated domestic political economy in Pakistan. I don't even know how one characterizes the political military feudal establishment. 
and I'll just add a, a couple of words if I may. Uh, first of all, Frank, the point about productivity and what counts and what doesn't count. I mean, Ma Maxine Byrne has this not in the not in the book we, we cite here, but we do mention it in the paper. This beautiful study where she shows how the literature that says there wasn't really productivity growth in the Industrial Revolution has this minor issue. They're only looking at male wages. And men were strong enough not to be pushed into these hyper explosive industrial relations. So all the productivity growth happened where they could use women and children, because the men were stuck, were, were, were holding on to their connections. So that's just, I'm sorry, that was just too perfect. Um, um, uh, so, uh, so I think it's impossible not to think of. Of, of violence in the context of racialization and capitalism. Uh, again, the different emphases. If you, if you look at the Barbados slave code, um, that's actually one that doesn't deal with um, uh, interracial sex, doesn't deal with, with uh, children uh, and, and who follows the mother or the father. It just deals with control. Why? Because gang labor was such that they all died. We basically killed everybody. Only in Virginia, you start to see this business of, 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 of anti-discrimination, blah, blah, and, and, and this, this, this essentially enslavement of Black women's reproduction because they're not killing them in the work. But then again, you look at, at the, the reactions, both in the first reconstruction and the second reconstruction of, of dealing with alleged formal juridical equality with criminalization. And so, I mean, this is a story. You know, we don't focus on it here. Obviously, one needs a lot more detail, different projects uh, layer more of that. But if you look at, at, at whether you're looking at, at, at um, 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 contract fraud and, uh, and, and, and vagrancy and all of the mechanisms that are essentially forcing uh, formerly enslaved black workers into debt peonage, or whether you're talking about Elizabeth Hinton's move on, on, on war on poverty and the, and the transition to war on crime as a mechanism of, of social control. I think that's, I mean, that's, um, um, those are obvious. On the war side, again, Guy, I don't know if you want to talk about the, the Puerto Rico work that, that you're doing, but this is, this is that, I mean, so that's doing a lot of work uh, there and with regard to the location of women. So women are the late reserve army of labor. Uh, Pinchbeck writes about the way in which the Napoleonic Wars, Roses of River is not a new invention. In the Napoleonic Wars, you see women brought into the workforce. And then, oh, cool, there are these people who will work under these terrible conditions. Now we can keep. Uh, uh, working them, as opposed to after World War II, you get the re-emergence of the family wage because the boys are coming home from war and we need to send Rosie Hulk. Uh, that, that becomes both institutionally in terms of the family wage and propagandistically in terms of the role of women in the home, does a lot of work to overcome this, this brief moment of, of freedom. So it's, it's constantly part of the story uh, because it's constantly a source of shock and a channel of legitimate violence that doesn't destabilize this basic idea that no, 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 this is just free exchange between juridically uh, equal people. Yeah, just going on uh, along that line too, that I think can't, we, we, we shouldn't separate the um, racialized violence or other kinds of violence into accidental and intentional so easily. I mean, the, the, the kind of destruction of, you know, sort of collective destruction of bodies of what workers, you know, could be subjected to that, um, you know, sort of routinized risk of, of, of loss of women and life and, and health, as well as the uh, communities that are the sacrifice zones of, of environmental pollution, particularly um, from the fossil fuel kind of economy. Um, so that, that's what I'm trying to kind of we say that it's there's not a, a kind of realm of militarization and then um, you know rational production it's it's a piece that we have to rethink um, and then on, on quantification I I just think um, that one of the big dangers and I think we, 
counting can be helpful. Okay, um, so we're, we're not I'm not against quantification, but um, but it's the framing of it as something um, that somehow outside of politics and it, that you can count without making um, normative and subjective up and and substantive judgments and. Recognizing that there's always this gap, and this is a critical accounting literature too. That there's always this gap between um, the formal, the formalism of the of, of um, quantitative analysis and the, the actual substance of, of things that matter in human society and, and in public policy to human well-being and natural well-being. That that what we're counting. You know, there's always another way to count it, and there's always something left out. But also that what we're counting, like I think that the Berger and 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 Richard have said that a lot of what we're counting is it's incommensurable. It's, it involves um, you know nonlinear and and highly uncertain and unpredictable and highly interdependent factors. And we can't um, atomize things like in the way that marginal costs. So that, that all those things have to be part of how we use um, the quantitative analysis, and that's a tough thing given how we have time for one more. Okay. <laughs> so, the actual dictates. Apologies, um, and let us thank our panel.